The Schuyler statue is down. The Albany Empire is done. Saratoga could host the Belmont Stakes in 2025, and Pride Month celebrations are in full swing here in the Capital Region. It's been a busy week in the newsroom. Coming up on this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the top headlines. This is, of course, disinformation. I believe you would call this website a false flag operation intended to spread uh, homophobic garbage. And our hunch that there was a time capsule buried beneath the Philip Schuyler statue outside of Albany City Hall has been confirmed. We'll talk about what workers found in the ground after they removed the controversial statue this week. You know, the fact that they put a time capsule here is an indication that they didn't expect it to be here forever. (laughs) This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. A look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union subscriber today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. All right, let's discuss now what appeared in the Times Union and on timesunion.com this week. We are welcoming back our intrepid Times Union editor-in-chief, Casey Seiler. We are going to talk about the top stories this week, and we will lead off with the Albany Empire. This is one of those weeks where we had to redo our segment because there was breaking news. So, Without further ado, what happened with the Albany Empire this week? Jess, very good setup. We are speaking at three o'clock on Thursday afternoon and a little bit more than an hour ago, Mark Singales reported that the National Arena League, which is the arena uh, football league that our very own Albany Empire are members of, is terminating the membership agreement of Antonio Brown's Albany Empire. Uh, the league said in a news release that uh, the decision was reached, and I'm quoting here, after an emergency conference call of the members in good standing to discuss the Empire's failure to pay their league-mandated and overdue assessments. We are obviously working right now to try and get comment from Antonio Brown, who has had, I think it's fair to say, a tumultuous, I believe that would be the adjective, three, four months of first minority ownership and then 95% ownership and, uh, you know, the other 5% being owned by a suburban couple that lives up in Saratoga Springs (laughs) who found themselves sort of in a shotgun business arrangement with Antonio Brown. This comes just after um, Brown was fined $1,000 for conduct detrimental to the league for recent public comments, uh, sort of a spat that he got into with another one of the owners. And after the announcement, Brown tweeted out, he is a big user of social media, major league, not minors. And he has not yet responded to a text seeking comment from Mark Singales. There was supposed to be a home game at MVP arena against the Jacksonville Sharks. Um, This coming Saturday, there was talk that AB was going to uh, suit up and play. The Sharks will not be coming to Albany, at least as of this recording. The team has only one win and six losses on a season that was supposed to roll into late July. So it has been, as noted, a a roller coaster ride of a last couple of months for the team that has seen multiple head coaches canned, you know, quarterbacks and other players let go. The team had only today, or I guess yesterday, had we reported on 
the hiring of a of a new QB after the um, the former you know centerpiece of the team's offense had had departed after the most recent loss. This story has been bizarre one to cover, but it is really sad because this was a team that lots of people enjoyed. It brought people downtown in what would otherwise be some kind of, you know, sleepy weekends through the winter, spring and and into the summer. It's going to be a, a little bit of a more boring uh, Albany without the Albany Empire and certainly without Antonio Brown. Absolutely. You can see video from his practice uh, this week that one of our reporters attended um, preparing for the would-be game on Saturday. That's over at timesunion.com. In downtown Albany, right in front of City Hall, where this past weekend um, the very controversial Philip Schuyler statue was finally taken down after three years. But there's a lot more to that that story than just the fact that the statue was taken down. So uh, let's start there. Casey, what can you tell us about what happened with the Schuyler statue, what we learned this week? Well, not to make uh, make this about us any more than it needs to be, for the last several weeks since kind of the beginning of May, the Times Union's Brendan Lyons and um, Steve Hughes have been asking questions of Mayor Kathy Sheehan's administration about the statue, the engineering report um, that was uh, called for in the mayor's uh, executive order um, that called for the statue to be removed as soon as possible. That executive order was three years ago, as you noted. So on Friday morning, we posted uh, Steve's story that noted that this had taken three years. There had been several changes in what the administration was saying about why the statue hadn't been moved yet. Initially, they said, well, we're not going to move it until it's got a new home. And then a couple of months ago, they said, oh, yeah, no, we're going to move it and put it into storage until it does finally get a new home. We asked for the engineering report and they denied um, Brendan Lyons's um, FOIL request. So that story went up very early Friday morning. (laughs) On, On Friday afternoon, we swung by. And when I say we, I mean I, on my way home, swung by the statue and noted that there were a lot of no parking signs that were going to go into effect the following morning at 4 a.m. And there were barricades kind of piled up right around there. Activity that indicated that there maybe there was going to be a farmer's market, which there wasn't, or maybe there was going to be some work done in the area in front of City Hall on Saturday morning. And sure enough, uh, Saturday morning, uh, just around dawn, a rigging company moved in and <laughs> it didn't take very long, except for the three years, of course, the statue was lifted off, put on a flatbed and sent on its way to what the city describes as a secure, undisclosed location. And then uh, subsequent to its removal, the city in the person of David Galen, Mayor Sheehan's uh, chief of staff, revealed why they had denied the FOIL request for the engineering report. They said that the engineering report revealed that the statue could be pulled over with, you know, a pickup truck and a chain and a strap, basically, that it was that it was not securely attached to the plinth that it was sitting on, had been sitting on for almost a century now. Between you and me, Jess, I do not think FOIL law allows you to hold back documents because a piece of city infrastructure has been found to be unsafe. But that is what the Sheehan administration said. We'll be having future discussions with them on this topic, no doubt. Absolutely. And if you want to see video of the statue being escorted away, if you will, we have some great video on timesunion.com and on our Instagram feed. It's, uh, It's a really interesting thing to watch. He looks a lot different when you take him down than when you when he's up there, you know, when you're that's, looking at him. That's what they say about all statues of problematic uh, former uh, former state uh, leaders. Um, <laughs> but yes, and thanks to to uh, Jim Franco and Rose Schneider for um, for being down there early on Saturday morning to cover the removal. All right, moving over now to Rensselaer County, where we reported this week that. Rensselaer County's only birthing center is um, going to be shuttered. Tell us more about what's going on over at Samaritan. 
Yeah. Um, uh, Samaritan is getting out of the baby birthing business unless you show up at the emergency room in labor, which uh, I am not recommending, but um, they obviously will not turn you away in that instance. But as far as being the planned destination for your labor and delivery, that is likely to end if their proposal to shut it down is accepted by the State Department of Health. That could happen as soon as this fall. Samaritan claims uh, that it is economically uh, unfeasible to continue with the birthing center, uh, that COVID, which uh, knocked back so many hospitals financially, ultimately put the stake through uh, this offering. You know, more than um, 800 babies born at the birthing center last year and so far a little bit more than than 300 this far into 2023. This is somewhat bound up in uh, Samaritan being essentially, you know, merged with St. Peter's Health Partners, which now owns the whole hospital, which is a I'm not sure what the term of art is, but it's essentially a Catholic directed medical organization, which makes it problematic to offer some reproductive services, such as, of course, abortion. But now going forward, you will have to go to, if you want want to plan your delivery, and once again, I recommend you do, you're going to have to go to closest Albany Medical Center or St. Peter's, or of course, hospitals in Niskayuna or Saratoga Springs. Absolutely. More on that on timesunion.com. Let's go down to Orange County now, um, the town of Warwick, where there was a situation where their pride celebration was um, in a way I don't I hijacked, for lack of a better term, um, and some really controversial stuff happened. So tell us what happened in, in Orange County this week. Yeah, you might call it an attempted hijacking just a couple of days before Warwick's uh, annual pride celebration, which took place on Sunday. A website popped up showing uh, signs and devoted to uh, what purported to be sort of a subset of the Pride celebration that celebrated uh, minor attracted persons. So in other words, promoting pedophilia. This is, of course, disinformation. I believe you would call this website a false flag operation intended to spread uh, homophobic garbage. Once inquiries um, began to be made about this, this anonymous website was shut down. I think it was Tuesday morning, Philip Pantuso, who did this outstanding story, realized that it was shut down. An email sent to the administrator garnered no response. So it's far from the first time, unfortunately, that pride events have been the target of this kind of thing. Uh, where false claims of pedophilia attend uh, all manner of LGBTQ events or programming or what have you. It's it's pretty disgusting. Absolutely. Uh, if you want to go over to timesunion.com and see something that is much more emblematic of, of Pride celebrations, we can, you know, we have lots of photos from Albany's Pride Parade, very colorful, fun photos. So check those out. Um, All right. Last but not least, a bit of tragedy here. Um, A very famous actor died in Albany this week. What happened? Yeah. Treat Williams, who lived um, up in Vermont in the the sort of uh, Dorset, Manchester area in southern Vermont, was killed uh, as he was riding his motorcycle based on law enforcement. It would seem that another driver or somebody in a vehicle pulled into his path and he was grievously injured. He was airlifted to Albany, where he was pronounced dead. Tree Williams was a hardworking actor. I, I don't know if you could if you could call him a star, but an outstanding character actor. And also, it would appear, based on previous coverage we've done of him, a mensch. Um, back in 2019, when. Albany International Airport workers were not receiving their paychecks because of the federal government shutdown. Treat Williams showed up to flip pancakes for them because he traveled in and out of that airport a lot when he was going out to to do work. And he said he just wanted to to support those workers. He turned out for other charitable events in the region and up in Vermont. 
you know, I've I've seen a bunch of his movies and uh, I would direct anybody who's interested to check out Sidney Lumet's Prince of the City, which is kind of a, a version of Serpico, you might say, which was also directed by Lumet, but which is far darker and far more epic, where Treat Williams is the main character, a cop who decides to turn a uh, witness against uh, corruption within the force and ends up paying the the kind of psychic toll for it. It's a remarkable performance, a movie that was, you know, really grim. And so I, I don't know if a lot of people have seen it, but it's it's got a great reputation and Treat Williams is just fantastic in that, as he is in in many films. So really sad, a real loss in his early 70s. Absolutely. I'll have to check that out because I have never seen that film. I went the other direction when I heard that he died and I looked up the scenes from Hair, the musical from 1979, which are, you know, uh, I'd never seen it before. So it was definitely something. (laughs) He's great in that as kind of the leader of the of the hippie band. Absolutely. Yes. Check it out. All right, Casey, thank you so much. Uh, We will check back in with you next week. Thanks, Jess. As always, you can learn more about all of the topics and the issues that we discuss on this podcast at timesunion.com or on any of our social channels. After the break, we will talk more about the Schuyler statue, specifically what they found underneath it. It's been 15 years since 12-year-old Jalik Rainwalker vanished. His disappearance from rural upstate New York was ruled a probable child homicide. But no one has ever been charged, and his body has never been found. This is Rainwalker, the Lost Boy. I'm Jessica Marshall. And I'm Wendy Lepertor. In this podcast from the Times Union, we'll take a deep dive into this mystery. The case of a missing child that has unsettled New York's capital region and beyond for more than a decade. Available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. As we discussed in the previous segment, the statue of Philip Schuyler no longer stands in front of Albany City Hall. Back in April, we had Times Union reporter Rose Schneider on the podcast. They'd been chasing down a rumor. Was there a time capsule buried beneath the statue when it went up in 1925? Rose was able to track down a number of documents that said allegedly there was. Last Saturday, Rose's hunch was proven true. City officials unearthed a bronze box that contained a treasure trove of relics from a century ago. Rose went down to City Hall on Saturday afternoon and caught up with the mayor, Kathy Sheehan. David, it sounded like it was not really that damaged, despite being stored for almost 100 years. Yeah, I mean, the materials inside were in very good condition. It appears that there is a lead or steel box and that the brass box was set inside of that box. There was a tremendous amount of packing material on top that appears to be cotton, linen, some some material. Uh, They didn't have peanut, you know, (laughs) foam peanuts back then. On Saturday, Mayor Sheehan said city officials were hesitant to investigate the treasures that lay within. She said they wanted to wait for a representative from the Albany Institute of History and Art before they really got into anything. But there was something, she said, that they could identify. So there is a an atlas um, for the city of Albany. Hey, Tony, what year is that atlas? 1876. From 1876. And She said there were also a set of books detailing the history of Albany, 
some letters, and possibly some coins and other solid artifacts. Yeah, you know, look, I think that it's interesting. There's been a lot of, um, obviously, controversy about moving the statue. And, uh, y you know, there are those who, who fear that we're trying to erase history. We're not erasing history. This um, statue is something that can be contextualized, and we would expect it to be put back on public display. The mayor says the city will be creating a monuments commission to decide where the statue will go, for now, it's in an undisclosed storage space. The circular spot in front of City Hall, where the statue once stood, is now being landscaped. In the future, the mayor says the circle may go away and the traffic pattern may change, but there are heaps of plans and permissions that need approvals before that could happen. I met up with Rose the following week in front of City Hall, where the jackhammering on the former statue circle was so loud that it rattled our skull. We've talked about this before on the podcast, mm -hmm. how you have been kind of tracking down this mystery yes. of whether or not there is a time capsule mm -hmm. underneath the statue somewhere, whether it's in the plinth or mm -hmm. elsewhere. Like, so you've got to be pretty excited that this oh, is yeah. happening. Um, no, I am. I uh, I was so excited. I think I was probably. Um, I do have to credit Akeem Norder, who did all like the background research before, in the past, and who got me to the sources that uh, basically indicated that there would be a time capsule inside. Because the original program, which I did find um, eventually a copy of at the Albany Public Library and reviewed, states that. It says encased in bronze chest within statue, and it has a whole list of all these historical documents and photos and coins that are inside. A very exciting find, yes. if, if, if it in fact existed. Yes. So they, according to the mayor, the bronze chest uh, was damaged enough that they couldn't take it completely out. So they managed to get the top off, and they basically took all of its contents out into boxes and brought them into City Hall, uh, along with apparently some sort of, like, stuffing that was used as packaging at the time. Hmm. But there was no, like, water damage or anything like that? No, that was the surprising thing. So I've heard from other people that Confederate statues that had come up around the same time, um, when those were taken down and they looked at time capsules inside, a lot of them were really badly damaged. But for whatever reason, whether this was because it was in the very, very foundation of the statue or because of the insulation or the, the copper box, according to the mayor's office, it's in perfectly good condition. Wow. So there's envelopes and envelopes of all these uh, different historical documents and records, including a list of its contents that seems to match, I believe, what the program said would be inside. And, um, and the program, letter. by the way, just for reference to 1925 is when this was all placed in the statue, yes. the statue was erected. Now this, you've been, you've been following this story for several months now, right? Yeah, since about March, um, when the, uh, obviously the mayor had announced three years ago that they wanted to take the statue down. Um, back in March, uh, there was this renewed push where they said the statue would be coming down in a matter of weeks and put into storage. Um, and shortly after that, that's when someone reached out to me and said, I'd heard there's a time capsule uh, in, you know, inside the statue. And I talked to you in the previous podcast all about this. Yes, that's setting up the, you know, plot of the next National mm -hmm. Treasure movie, right? Yeah. You know, the fact that they put a time capsule here is an indication that they didn't expect it to be here forever. <laughs> um, so, you know, things change, times change. You know, we're, we're going to be reimagining some of the front of City Hall so that we can make it accessible for people in wheelchairs. I don't know if the people in uh, 1925 thought it was going to come down today. Or the way that it came down or under the, the circumstances. Or the way that it came down. But, um, I don't know, I, I think that's just kind of an interesting, you know, thought in mind that they did think that someday someone was going to uncover this somehow. I don't know, wonder what circumstances they thought it would be, but um, I don't know, I guess that was kind of interesting. Yeah, and here we are. There has been an update since we talked, which was yesterday. 
the mayor of Albany opened up the time capsule and shared what was inside. So without further ado, I am dying to know what was inside the time capsule. Well, we don't know everything that's in the time capsule yet. Mm -hmm. So during a press conference uh, today, Thursday at noon, uh, the mayor announced that the city officials and the Albany Institute of History and Art opened up the deed that declared who the contents of this time capsule should go to. It says, this box and its contents are hereby given to the mayor or chief executive officer of the city of Albany, New York, to be placed by him, how cute, in custody. And of course, direction. Yes. So of course, Kathy, she had um, said, I think at one point remarked, oh, how cute uh, (laughs) that is. Uh, because, it, you know, it was very, very much said, you know, it'll be under whatever uh, he decides is the best, uh, you know, his- historical society to take care of these contents um, that that it was below in a museum then. <laughs> so this is among the documents that we are going to be transferring to the Albany Institute of History and Art. Uh, a preeminent, preeminent museum, one of the oldest museums in the country, and a museum that is truly known. For- so the mayor's office uh, announced today that it'll go to the Albany Institute of History and Art. But in reviewing it and in this uh, big presser today, we did get a sort of sneak peek about what is inside. So the contents include a flag, an American flag with 48 stars. That would mean that what Alaska and Hawaii weren't states yet, or weren't recognized yet. Yeah, because this was June. So this was almost ninety-eight years ago to the day. It was June fourteenth, nineteen twenty-five, that they wow. uh, put this time capsule in the ground. So they yeah did not have Alaska or Hawaii yet. So it was an only only forty-eight stars on this American flag that they uh, tucked inside. Um, they had, I think we talked about this a little bit um, because we did have a bit of an idea of what was in there already, but an atlas of the city of Albany from the 1870s. Wow. Um, Yeah. So there's literally you open it up, you see like, you know, people's streets laid out um, page by page. We have these historical records for the city of Albany, um, these medals. And we also have, which is very interesting because I don't think this was in the program about the statues unveiling, so I don't think this was really known to anyone. All these letters that uh, George Hawley had requested people send to him to include inside. Interesting. Now, George Hawley, for reference, because we talked about this on a previous episode, but we haven't introduced him here. He was the man who commissioned the erection of the statue, right? Yes, that's correct. He, um, I believe, sponsored it. He got a very famous sculptor at the time to commission it in memoriam of his uh, recently deceased wife, Theodora, for the city of Albany in 1925. Yeah. I mean, is that all or is there more stuff that was in the that they revealed was in the time capsule? So uh, there is more stuff. It's still a lot of it is still sealed with um, wax or gum. And it's believed that that's going to be things like coins, photographs, newspaper clippings that were all put in there. And we know that because that there was a program for the statues unveiling that documented all of this. We talked about that yesterday. Mm-hmm. You tracked that document down. Yes. If anyone ever wants to look at it, they can ask the uh, Albany Public Library to reserve it for them. You can't take it out of the library. You have to sit in a room in the library and review it. But we did track that down, looked at it. So what's next is the Albany Institute of History and Art has taken the documents and they will be kind of unsealing everything else and reviewing it and preserving it. And they mentioned briefly the hopes to have an exhibit on this in the fall. So uh, hopefully, you know, come uh, this fall, we will have sort of a more comprehensive look at everything. Uh, We also got to see the time capsule itself. It's a what looks like a bronze colored box. It was a bit damaged, um, which I think we also talked about had been kind of stuck in the ground. So they removed the top, got all the contents out, and eventually they got the entire box out. So we saw that there. We saw all the packing material um, kind of in a plastic container off to the side that was used to store these because, um, like we mentioned before, it is, you know, 
incredibly well preserved for what's in there. I mean, when we were there, a curator from the museum was, she had gloves on, but was literally able to pick everything up and just like, you know, open up things like the Atlas and go from page to page without any, you know, fear of, you know, damage. That's remarkable. Well, we uh, look forward to seeing that opening if they do an exhibit with all of the stuff. It's very exciting. This kind of brings, not to a close necessarily because there's still more to see, but, you know, this brings a, a, a resolution to the mystery that you've been pursuing for the last couple of months. How does that feel? I am I am very excited about it. I know that there's kind of a lot of other uh, factors going into the statue, a lot of debate about, you know, should it have come down? What does it represent? So this is kind of just sort of a little sidebar. And I know, you know, maybe seems less significant, but I think it's just very interesting to me because there was so, you know, little known to act, you know, actually conclude if it was in there or not. So now we actually get to not only know for sure there's time capsule, but, well, you know, what's inside. Mystery solved. I love it. All right, that's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall. We'll be back next week with another look inside the newsroom here at the Times Union. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, or head on over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features. The Eagle is a production of the Times Union. It's produced and edited by me, Jessica Marshall, with help from the Times Union digital team and the newsroom. Special thanks this week to Casey Seiler, Rose Schneider, and Julian Silva-Forbes for their contributions to this episode.